Hussein Mubelino. Your next task is to get a selfie. Okay, you move really fast. Okay, so you need to be. Um. Okay. Wow. Um. I'm just looking around and I'm I'm kind of close to tears, seeing so many people here from so many different places. Um. But let's not cry too much. Let's just crack on with the uh, with the keynote, shall we? Um, the first keynote is entitled Challenges and Possible Solutions to Optimizing Talent Identification and Development in Sport. If imagining football, you know, the last few years we had Messi and Ronaldo being the top two footballers in the world. The first two speakers are like the Messi and Ronaldo of the, you can decide who's who, right? Um, but um, they are like the Messi and Ronaldo of talent development and identification um, scientific research, okay? So we're gonna have Kevin Till, is a professor of athletic development and a colleague of mine at the same university in, in the mm -hmm. Carnegie School of Sport at Leeds Beckett University. He's the co-director of the Carnegie Applied Rugby Research Center. He's published only 180 international scientifically reviewed papers over, over the last 10 years, he's not that old, um, related to youth athletes, talent identification and development, sports science, coaching, and his research uh, and applied work has literally changed policy and practice in youth sport. He's also a practicing strength and conditioning coach at Leeds Rhinos Rugby League uh, Club um, in Leeds within the academy programs. And that's Messi. Ronaldo is Professor Joe Baker, okay, head of the Lifespan Performance Laboratory at York University in Canada. His research considers the varying influences on optimal development or human development ranging from issues affecting athlete development and skill acquisition to barriers and facilitators of optimal aging. He works with high performance sport teams and organizations around the world in their quest for international success. He literally wrote the book or the books on talent development, the latest one called The Tyranny of Talent, how it compels and limits athlete achievement available from Amazon. I don't get a commission, okay? Um, but please go and, go and read the book. Please welcome Kevin and Joe or Ronaldo and Messi, okay? Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, the invite to, uh, to talk today, uh, especially to I, I Coach Kids. Thank you for the uh, the great introduction, uh, Sergio. Um, I guess in terms of this presentation, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not not the messy, but I'm going to try and. Uh, and I, what I will do is really set set Joe up to uh, to score the goal. Really, I'm just going to set up this presentation, and and, uh, and 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 Joe will sort of work his magic in terms of ask, asking and and hopefully answering a, a real important question in 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 relation to the, to uh, to this. So, um, so let, let's go. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so the um, so the International Olympic Committee uh, published a consensus statement on youth athletic development in 2016, and and they open they open their paper with uh, with this statement. They say the goal is clear. It's to develop healthy, capable, and resilient young athletes while attaining widespread, inclusive, sustainable, and enjoyable participation and success for all levels of individual athletic achievement. So I guess in, in relation to, to this conference, talking around talent identification development and, and dropout, and really what I Coach Kids is about, this, this statement for me really um, emphasizes that, and that's, that's the goal for all of us. And if I was to break that, this sort of statement down into, into three areas, which um, are three of the questions that we, we believe are really important from a talent identification development perspective, the first one is around the opportunity that young people get. So what opportunities do, do the young people get to allow them to be successful and, and healthy from a, from a sport perspective? The statement is broken down to athletes um, and young people generally. So there's a question there around talent identification and, and how are uh, young people identified as talented to get, the, get these opportunities? And then thirdly, this idea around healthy development and what does that mean for, for all young people, whether they are athletes or not? So these are a real three three areas that we will be touching on in in terms of our uh, in terms of our workshops. 
<clears throat> sorry for the the use of the uh, the English and British pictures, but ultimately, talent identification development systems. Their end goal is around this. It's around achieving uh, success in sport, whether that is uh, Olympic gold medals or whether in professional sports that is around winning trophies. Okay, that is what nationally governing bodies, organisations, and professional sports clubs are doing in in relation to that. And <clears throat> what these uh, organisations use is this idea of a talent identification development system to help them achieve those goals, to help them achieve that end goal around winning winning performance. And simply, a talent identification development system is around moving from uh, standard practice. OK, so standard coaching, standard practice, standard things that youth people get to really as high a quality as possible. And within that, it's how we use the resource, uh, resource financially and from a, a, a time and per, a person perspective and how we can do that as efficient, efficiently as, as possible. OK, so it's how we move from that standard practice to a high quality as possible in turn and, and using the resource that's available as efficiently as possible. <laughs> But what makes this challenge, what uh, makes this really difficult is that this idea of these talent identification development systems and where they start and thinking around their end goal is ultimately they start in, in young people. They start in, in children in some sports, adolescents in others. And, they, and again, there's a lot of variability there in relation to when they, when they occur. But ultimately, this end goal around producing um, team or uh, Olympic success is starting with, with, with these people in front of us and the people that all we work with. <clears throat> so if we think around a talent identification development system, um, what we've got is that they're within this uh, normative population, within a, a, a sports population and a number of people that uh, participate, in, participate in that sport, is this idea that we're looking to identify and then select a small number of those people into, into the next stage of that program. So that ends up looking like this, where a small number of uh, participants get selected to the next stage, and then at the next stage, a smaller number of participants. So ultimately we get to this idea around this professional Olympic level, okay? You'll see a number of arrows within this, so that there's opportunities for people to come in and out of that and sometimes um, go, go back stages. But this, this sort of uh, system idea is really based upon a, on a pyramid. So if you think this, I guess the UK, uh, UK sport pyramid is that we've got community sport at, at, at the bottom of the pyramid. And then across that, we've got a number of stages until we reach that podium or, or Olympic level. And this idea around a uh, pyramid system ultimately comes down to two, two things. As we go up the pyramid, the number of opportunities available to get selected on that pyramid decrease. But as we increase and go up the pyramid, the support and provision that's provided within that system increases. So they're the two real basic uh, principles that support this idea of a talent identification development system. Again, back to this idea around resource to, to, uh, to allow that. But ultimately, more resource from, resource from a support provision perspective is provided to a lower number of participants. Now, what that does is it raises to, to, to us, and, and this is some of the things we've wrote about, is, is some, some big questions that need to be answered. Uh, and, and hopefully that's what we'll be able to, to provide over uh, today. Is, is Firstly, is in terms of this pyramid system, how is that system structured in terms of the opportunities that to, to, uh, to youth sport participants across the various stages of that, uh, that pyramid? Um, and, and how many uh, children get those opportunities. So how is the system structured? And we know that different sports have different systems in place. The second question is then, from all those uh, individuals that play that sport, how, how do we effectively identify what we call talent? Or how do we effectively identify the, the, the young people that get those opportunities to move up the pathway and get better opportunities? And then thirdly is, Regardless of that, how, how healthy is this idea around talent development? How healthy is the system? And how healthy are each of those different environments in, in terms of the, the provision that's provided to, uh, to, to young people? So there, for me, are three, three key, key questions uh, that we need, need, to, uh, need to think around. So I guess probably, probably the reason that uh, we, me and Sir, uh, Joe were, were asked to present here is, um, I guess we, we wrote a, a, a paper on, the, on, on this uh, a couple of years ago titled Challenges and Possible Solutions to Optimising Talent Identification Development in Sport. Uh, that was published in, uh, in Frontiers. And in, in that, we, we, I guess, 
uh, wrote about three, three, main, three main challenges related back to, the, to the, those questions. And in relation to that paper, and probably what we'll talk about today is, although we work in uh, academic institutions as researchers and scientists, I guess um, we also work as practitioners and coaches. And sometimes in the real world, those two areas can be uh, separated and, and, and seen to, to differ in their opinion. And I guess from our philosophy and how we tried to wrote the paper and all the work that we do, it's, um, it's around bridging that gap between science and, and practice. Because ultimately, if you are a coach working with young people on the ground or you're an academic doing research and science, for, for in my, my belief is that really we're all working towards the same goal. And that goal is back to that statement that was presented at, at the beginning in relation to the IOC uh, consensus statement. Um, so that is our philosophy around some of the things that we're talking about. And again, regardless of where you sit in the, the hierarchy and structure of sport, whether you're a national governing body organization that's in chat working with policy or you're a coach scout on the ground, we all are working towards the same goal and we need to consider the science and research and the practice that we're working towards. So in relation to that, I, it's now time to, to, to hand over to Joe, um, really with this simple um, all on paper, simple, but very complex question. What is talent? So uh, over to you, Joe. Thanks, Kev. Um, like it or not, the idea of talent is entrenched in all of our athlete development systems. It underpins the reason for athletes streaming at younger ages. Um, and one of the things that we focused on in our research program over almost the last 10 years is unpacking this concept. And one of the things that we found, and we could probably do this in this room, we won't because it's too large of a group, but if we were to ask people, what does talent mean to you? We would find a high degree of variability in the responses. And that's a problem for something that's so entrenched in our athlete development frameworks. We did a study last year where we brought in 10 uh, of Canada's elite distance running coaches. We had 10 different definitions of what talent was. And so if we can't agree on what this concept is, how do we measure it? How do we evaluate it? How do we assess whether the frameworks we have for athlete development are actually effective? Uh, and so we think this is a fundamental flaw in the way that we deliver athlete development because we focus on this, uh, this word um, uh, too much. As a scientific concept, and here I think this is an important distinction. So even though Kev reinforced that we're working towards the same goal, I think it's important to distinguish between the way scientists use the word talent, which is as a scientific concept, based on the idea that there are differences between humans and those differences affect their potential for development in certain areas. If your peak height velocity says you're going to be seven foot five, and mine says I'm gonna be five foot five, then you have an advantage in sports where height is important. That's the reality of uh, biological differences at the population level. Talent, we think is uh, in a way to clarify what this concept is, we've proposed a scientific definition that tries to capture the essence of what talent means to researchers, but also to practitioners in the way that they commonly use that term. And so we, in our definition, set the standard that talent is innate characteristics. It's not always used that way by researchers and coaches. But if you want to distinguish what talent is from skill, from experience, from learning, it has to be the innate part. It has to be the biological part because otherwise you're using words synonymously and you might as well just call it skill. You might as well call it development. To, tell, to set up a scientific study to actually see whether talent matters or whether it exists, we need to have a clear definition. And so we say it's biology. It's the biological differences between people. From there, we recognize building out layers of complexity. So it's multidisciplinary. Nowhere in human endeavor is it more multidisciplinary than we see in sport. Sport captures the fine motor skills of music. It captures the attentional skills of chess. It puts a 300 pound person in front of you that his job is to prevent you from executing those skills. No other domain except for armed combat has the complexity that we see in sport. 
And so we've got to capture that complexity. That's part of what coaches have to do is make immensely impactful decisions on some of the most complex things that we ever ask humans to do. We don't look at kids in, in primary school and say, you're a doctor, you're a scientist, you're a garbage collector, but we stream kids into sport with that intention. Uh, and that's a problem. The problem comes because of the other elements. Over time, talent is not a predictable linear path. It's an emergent one. It's determined by the environments that we put kids in. It's dynamic and unpredictable, chance, randomness. All of these things make the task that we ask coaches to do in terms of selecting who gets what resources and when, um, it makes that task monstrously complicated possibly to the point where it's, we shouldn't do it at all, it's so complicated. But we put coaches in a resource limited system where they don't have unlimited spots for the kids. They, they actually have to make those decisions because of resource limitations, not because they want to, and oftentimes not because they believe that talent is something that they can see and they wanna say, well, this is definitely the, the athlete. She definitely has the skills to be an Olympian. No, they're uncomfortable most of the time making those decisions, but the system forces them to make those decisions because of resource limitations. The last element, which even adds a further degree of complexity is the symbiotic relationship to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. And in a lot of sports, you can predictably anticipate the degree that performance is gonna increase from one Olympic games to the next, for example. If you run as fast as you did or row as quickly as you did to win in Tokyo, that probably isn't going to win you a medal in Paris. You have to be better than we used to be because performance evolves, skills evolve, team sports evolve. So we have to be able to anticipate where that target's going to be in our athlete development system for an athlete that's in the system maybe 10 or 15 years before the time we want to see that peak performance. That's how complicated this is. That's the degree of complexity that scientists are capturing. How coaches use the word talent is a different kind of thing. Coaches use it from a utilitarian or a pragmatic perspective. It's how can I use the elements measured here and now today to make better likelihood estimates of who's going to be successful in the future? Because if I'm limiting who gets access to resources, putting people into uh, streams that allow them greater likelihood of success is maybe the best that we can do as coaches. And so from, for coaches, it's pragmatic. It has nothing to do with the scientific element of differences between humans. It's how can I do my job better? How can I be a better coach? How can I be more effective with the limited resources that I get access to? And so this distinction between what talent means for a scientist and what it means for a coach is actually really important because the nerds like me can sit in our labs and talk about this all the time. And I think there's good evidence for the differences between humans. Where it becomes problematic though, is the idea that we can clearly and definitively measure it in young uh, people. Um, that's the way our system is set up. And I think it's a fundamental flaw uh, and I think this idea of talent is important for researchers, but maybe irrelevant for coaches. Why do I say this? Well, one of the things that we've done in our lab is look at the amount of scientific support that we have for this concept. So how much evidence do we actually have to help coaches do these kinds of selections and do their job around athlete selection and development better? amazingly limited uh, evidence that we have to help coaches. So this is a systematic review we did a few years ago that looked at just what we call gold standard research. So longitudinal designs, um, two skill group comparisons, and the difference between the skill groups had to be the variables that they were interested in. So did the variable predict the difference in the skill groups and did it track at least over a one year period? When we do that, we limit the research evidence base to almost zero studies. We go from about 1500 articles on talent as a scientific concept down to just 20 studies over a 25 year period. That's less than one good study a year that's coming out that can help coaches from a gold standard uh, of evidence. Most of the work 
focuses on things that are easy to measure, physical, anthropometric uh, characteristics, the complicated things. When you ask coaches, why do you think that athlete has what it takes and this one doesn't? Why do you want to keep them for your program instead of another one? They don't talk about physical stuff uh, the majority of the time. They talk about psychological things, intangibles. I don't know. There's something. They have it, the it factor. No studies essentially have looked at those kinds of characteristics. And when they have, they've reduced those characteristics down to things like grit or uh, resilience. The psychological makeup of a high performance athlete at the peak level is monstrously complicated. But now try to map that backwards and how it evolves over time in a youth performer and what needs to change over the 10, 20 years of athlete development to capture that complexity that's just happening in a single variable. Uh, we have no studies that have even tried to tap into and explore that, that complexity. Another one that we did, uh, review that we did was a scoping review that came out a couple of years ago um, that looked at all of those 1500 articles that we started with in the systematic review. We were interested in looking at, well, what did they look at? How much evidence do we have in, for females in sport, for example, because our not, a lot of our national development models are based on the idea that we can take what we know about male sport and just apply it to females as if there's not going to be any difference between how males and females develop. And so we wanted to challenge that idea. And so we did a scoping review of a massive amount of evidence in the area and found that Predictably, there were limitations. Most of the work in this area focuses on males. Most of it focuses on um, countries like Australia, Canada, UK, Germany, uh, sports like soccer and rugby. And the majority of them come from cross-sectional samples, snapshots in time. What do you 11, U11 uh, elite players look like today? Again, only capturing, scratching the surface of the complexity that we're trying to capture. Uh, in the, the way we need to be looking at athlete development models. The other thing that we think, or the other reason we think talent has a limited uh, relevance for coaches is because the models that we have are not complicated enough to capture all of the things that are interacting over that time. Talent isn't a single thing. It's physical, mental, psychological, cognitive, but it's all of those things interacting at once. And the interaction shifts across development. Early in development, physical skills are so important. If you look at little kids playing on a field, the, most of the time, the one that's more biologically advanced in terms of growth and maturation is performing better, but they don't always perform better, right? Basketball uh, in the NBA height doesn't predict a single variable, uh, a performance related variable in, in basketball performance. That doesn't mean height's not important. It just means that the group has become homogeneous for height. Everybody is tall. And so in order to predict, we actually have to have variability. And so in our sports system where the variability shrinks in some variables, but expands in others, we don't capture that in our models. We also have few useful indicators for how we make good selections early on. And the reason for that is the things that drive elite performance um, early in this process, early in the pathway are not the same things that drive it later in the pathway. <clears throat> There's a shift in the value of key performance indicators as athletes develop. We also have a limited understanding of how that development happens. Most of the research in this area, somewhere around three quarters of the data that we have is from cross-sectional samples, which means we get a lot of information about what elite U11s or U13s look like but that assumption that the person who's an elite U11 is going to turn into this elite performer at the end of the pathway, we might not be uh, able to be that confident in that trajectory. What we need is actually the people that stayed in the pathway that weren't the highest levels of performer. We actually need to know how bad you could be as a U11 year old and still emerge at the end of the pathway as an elite performer later. When we only capture the elites across the whole system, we assume that the pathway looks like that instead of potentially looking like that, a gradual increase in uh, performance over time, which would feed motivation, which would feed feelings of competence. Or it could look like this, which is just a noisy pattern that's completely unpredictable. Either of those would be helpful for us for the development of uh, high-performance athlete uh, modeling, because that would say, 
we shouldn't do any prediction at all. Let's provide more opportunities through the pathway instead of streaming people, but we don't have this evidence. Uh, and it would be really valuable if we did. The other big limitation that we have that we've spent a lot of time in our lab uh, looking at our biases or, or um, flaws that we have in the way that we deliver sport. These can be system related things like relative age effects or dominance of certain socioeconomic status groups. Um, it could be this thing that we've identified in North American uh, sport, which is called the birthplace effect, where there's an advantage, seems to be an advantage from coming from a medium sized city compared to a large city or a small town. Um, there's also individual effects. So these are the, the bottom uh, right-hand corner here. Your left is the uh, cognitive bias codex, which is 200 different information processing biases that humans have. Most of the time, these biases show up when we have to make decisions about risk. And for coaches, making a talent selection decision is a risk decision. What's the risk of keeping this person from having them leave our, our system? Mindset the quality of data that's produced, these are all limitations that affect the efficiency and accuracy of our athlete development pathway. So talent is the, is the T word of sports. We need to be careful how we use it. Um, for coaches, I think if you're going to use it at all, use it as a pragmatic, uh, in a pragmatic way, use it as a idea that it's the absence or presence of certain variables that allow me to be a little more accurate in the way that I deliver my sport, in the way that I make my athlete selections. Um, but remember, it's emergent. It's um, influenced by the environment. <clears throat> it's highly individual. So we have a goal, and, and I think Kev captured this right. We all have the same goal. But the way we deliver this, um, uh, this approach, it needs to be recognized the limitations that the system places on us as coaches. It's fine to say we should never select, but that's not the reality that coaches live in. Their time is limited. The facility use is limited. The resources they have to play with are limited. And so we need to recognize that and come up with something that's gonna capture that, um, uh, that recognition. For researchers, we'll focus on this stuff. We'll keep providing as much scientific evidence as we can to capture this complexity, to capture why it's difficult to measure and all those other nuances. And again, recognizing that our goal here is the same. How do we keep as many people in the system as long as possible we want to do that because it's positive for all the people in the system, but from a selfish talent development standpoint, it's also a more effective way of developing talent because if we keep people in the system longer, they have a greater likelihood of emerging in that system as talented athletes later. Thanks everyone. I look forward to questions.